in the Midlands Centre. So, as I said before, welcome. Um, we're obviously in uh, challenging times that we've all been through for the last few months. So, first of all, I hope everyone's well, family and friends are well. Um, and uh, yeah, just, yeah, the reason we're doing this virtually is because of the particular circumstances that we're all facing at the moment. Um, I'll just say a little bit about the programme. We this, as I said, is the first uh, lecture in our in our series that runs through till uh, April next year. The uh, events are on the IMICI website, so if anybody needs help finding them on there, uh, you can get in touch with with the committee after after tonight. Um, there were um, the programme was produced and printed, and there were postal versions issued out to people who'd chosen postal preferences in their in their iMeki communication. Yet again, if you've not got a, a version posted and you'd like one, please do get in touch. We're planning to run all our sessions virtually for the rest of this particular year through to the end of 2020. We're just reviewing, and, and that's in line with IMECI policy actually, so the IMECI are doing all of their activities virtually until the end of the year. We are looking to try and resume um, sort of real world lecture in 2021, but as we all know, this will be entirely dependent on um, the, the COVID-19 situation and government guidelines, etc. But we are we are putting plans in place to try and go back live if we can. Um, we welcome any feedback on the program and and particularly uh, on the way we're delivering these remotely. So again, do do get in touch if you've got any uh, comments or suggestions. I'd also like to just thank the the committee members who uh, who I work or will work collectively to to put the program together and to organise these and the speakers who volunteered to 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 participate. Um, it's been a little more difficult in the climate that we're in, um, but we've managed to put a programme together and we have some excellent speakers lined up, uh, of which the first one is, is Dave Horton and we'll introduce David in a minute. Um, just in terms of logistics, uh, this is obviously I can talk and David will be talking in a minute. Uh, there's no uh, sort of uh, communication back the other way sort of verbally, but what uh, you are encouraged to do if you'd like is you can you can raise questions and answers for the Q&A session that we'll hold at the end of the lecture uh, by going to your Q&A uh, box at the bottom right hand corner of your uh, screen. And if you want to register a question when we get to the Q&A, uh, the, the, your, your question will be uh, will be raised if there's time to do so. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, David Horton. So David is the chief engineer at Viva Rail. He's a chartered mechanical engineer. Um, started his career with Bombardier in Derby, uh, and then went uh, and went on to work on a number of different projects, including the class uh, 22X fleets. Um, after spending a little bit of time in the heritage sector, he joined Viva Rail in September 2018 as chief engineer. So uh, I'll now hand over to David, who will uh, give us a, uh, an overview of Viva Rail and particularly the, uh, the 230 fleets, which are very topical at the moment. So David, welcome and uh, I'll hand over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Jason. Hope you can hear me all. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to um, speak to you tonight, um, especially as it's the sort of first in this format, which is um, particularly terrifying. Um, so hopefully this will go well. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about Fever Rail, where we've come from and where we hope to go. Some of this will be known to you, I expect, because you'll have seen us in the press, um, but perhaps some of it will be um, of interest and, and, and not quite so well known. So I'm just going to do the obligatory about me bit. Um, the reason I put this picture up, this is the, the Welsh Highland Railway uh, in its construction phase. And this was when I was at university, studied mechanical engineering, Imperial College. And what the, the, the relevance of the picture is that um, I helped to restart the Railway Society there. And some of the activities we got involved in were, um, well, basically re rebuilding this um, two foot gauge railway across the across Snowdonia. And Adrian Shooter, who will come up in a minute, um, was the president of the Railway Society. So that is um, really, I guess, how my association with Beaver Rail started very early on, I suppose. Um, so yes, apart from having lots of interesting engineering things to do at university, there was the Railway Society. Um, when I graduated uh, in 2007, I um, joined the graduate scheme at Bombardier, um, which again was a very, very um, good move. I think it was a very nice little team in, in Bombardier Bogey Division at the time. Um, um, I, 
know some of you from, from that time there, learned an awful lot about railway vehicle dynamics, structures, um, you know, how trains work, probably the best place to be for a mechanical engineer, uh, for the most interesting bit of the train. I still go on about bogeys uh, with a sort of uh, uh, lyrical tone. <laughs> but um, after seven or eight years in, in bogey division, I um, went into services and I was a fleet maintenance engineer on the uh, class 220 and 222 fleets. Um, and that did me well for nine years. And then I had a bit of a diversion into heritage and I was uh, chief engineer, chief mechanical engineer of the West Somerset Railway. And again, this picture is quite nice for those of you who are based in Derby. This at the time we had three old Derby products um, based on the line, all operating two seven Fs and one four uh, F for those who care about these things. Um, and that was a very um, interesting 18 months for many reasons. Anyway, um, in 2018, I, um, um, I left there and I, I joined Viva Rail and that's where it all starts really. Um, so the, the history of Viva Rail, if you like, back in 2013 or 2014, uh, there was a, a widely acknowledged shortage of uh, diesel multiple units in the UK. And um, because the mainstream manufacturers, I think, uh, couldn't or couldn't or wouldn't or whatever, couldn't produce enough DMUs uh, to meet the what was then quite a strong, you know, a, a strong demand. Um, Adrian Shooter, who was retiring from Chilton Railways as chairman of Chilton Railways at the time, saw an opportunity to repurpose um, the D78 stock. Um, London Underground D78 stock, which was um, coming to the end of its life uh, on London Underground, to be replaced, as, as we know, with the um, S stock. Um, now, the D78 stock was introduced in late 1970s, uh, I think from about 1978 to 1983, they were introduced. And um, at the time, they were uh, a step forward um, for several reasons. I think they were the first to use sliding doors. Um, they were the first to have a, a, uh, a train management system, uh, albeit very basic compared to what we have now. And um, obviously they used aluminium body shells, um, which I think the method of construction at the time uh, was, was quite new as well. So these units were um, designed, manufactured by Metro Camel, uh, which obviously became Alstom in later years. And they did good service uh, on the district line for, um, Best part of 30 years, might, might even be 40 years. So here's a picture of one at uh, Ealing Common in, in 1980. Um, now they had, I suppose, what you might call a bit of a midlife crisis um, when the original bogies started cracking up due to twisty track, a lot of fatigue issues in the bogies. And um, in the late 1990s, I think, um, Bombardier, then Adtrans were commissioned to design new bogies for them. Uh, reusing some of the existing traction equipment, but the novelty about the new bogies was that they were the first use of the flexible frame design, which later became very widespread. And for those that don't know, the, flex the flexible frame design is two half frames um, with a sort of knuckle joint um, at the end of uh, an articulated joint. Um, and that gives them very, very good um, primary stiffness or very, very low primary stiffness um, and allows them obviously to negotiate what is essentially pretty twisty track. Um, and that set the precedent for other fleets to come, um, Northern Line and, and later on S-Stock and uh, VLU as well. Oh, wrong way, sorry. Okay. Um, not long after the, the new bogies, um, they also had a, uh, an interior upgrade, again done by uh, Bombardier at Derby. And... Um, Appropriately enough, this was the time I, I joined Derby, so I saw these going through the workshop there. Um, and um, the, the upgrade consisted of um, getting rid of the old maple flooring, getting rid of the old, um, uh, putting in new grab rails, uh, obviously a complete re-upholstery, um, new draft screens, I think, or certainly reglazed, a lot of uh, LED lighting, uh, new passenger information system, all that good stuff. Uh, so what came out was almost like a new train. So having had all that, I suppose when, it, when, when time came to withdraw the D78s, they still had a lot of useful life left in them. 
and that was one of the main reasons why they were so attractive as a donor vehicle. Um, and, but I suppose nobody really expected them to be purchased en masse um, and converted into diesel trains. And when the idea was first mooted, it was, um, I suppose, widely derided. Uh, you, you can never do it. Why would you do such a silly thing? Um, but in fact, uh, it turned out to be quite a quite a sort of visionary thing to do. And of course, there were problems along the way, which we'll, which we'll go into. Um, uh, but one of the main, you know, the main reasons going back to why these were a good donor vehicle is because they had aluminium body shells, which um, had very low levels of corrosion. Not to say there weren't wasn't any corrosion, that there is some corrosion, but but um, nowhere near as much as you'd expect from a, a similarly aged uh, steel body vehicle. And they had, as I say, new interior, um, pretty new bogies. So really the core components were, uh, had, had a lot of useful life left on them. And this is showing uh, the S stock uh, in comparison to the, the D78. Of course, the other good thing about the D78 is they were built very largely to a, um, a mainline loading gauge because um, they weren't um, deep level trains, they were just subsurface trains. So the decision was taken to set up Beaver Rail and um, Adrian and some uh, other directors uh, got together, purchased uh, most of the carriages, not quite all of them. Um, they were originally six car units um, and Beaver Rail only purchased the driving motor cars and the non-powered trailer cars but there were originally um, motored trailer cars as well. Um, so we had something like, I think it's over 200 cars, um, but about 168 left um, for those who like to know these things uh, that have not been earmarked for, for contracts. Um, and V-Rail set about um, converting them into um, uh, diesel electric multiple units. So one of the first things that had to be done um, was they had to be they had to be made crashworthy. Um, now, obviously, the London Underground being a closed system without any uh, level crossings, um, really the the drivers the cab um, was not up to the standard for operating on UK mainline railways, where obviously you've got lots of um, unguarded level crossings, where level crossings are the biggest safety risk to trains. Um, so one of the first things that had to be done was a uh, crash structure or survival space had to be designed. And this was done by um, putting in uh, essentially a roll cage into the uh, into the cab. The original cab desk and controls had to be stripped out and completely redesigned around the um, the, the roll cage. Um, and the roll cage then had to be tested, um, which is what the image there shows you. Now there is a, a lovely video on YouTube, um, or several videos actually, where you can have a look at the crash actually taking place. Um, in real time. That tank there is a three ton tank of water. Uh, they, we had to make a case, we, we, uh, the simulations originally showed that the, the redesigned structure wouldn't stand up against the, the, full, uh, the full mass of a lorry tanker um, and it had to be, uh, I suppose, derogated to, uh, to say that it was the, the, the level of risk was appropriate for the lines they'd be operating on. So, um, and that eventually manifested itself as a, as a three ton um, tank of water. And the aftermath of the crash test um, was actually, uh, there wasn't too much damage. I mean, obviously the front was stove in, but we proved in doing that, that the um, drivers, that the driver's survival space was preserved. So there was no incursion into, into the survival space. Another aspect of the front end is that it's got armor plating um, around the, um, just below the windows and um, up the up the middle, um, and that's to stop anything piercing through the front of the train and obviously taking out the driver's limbs or or, or legs or whatever. So that was one problem dealt with, um, and then of course we had to deal with. Um, and I say we, I wasn't around at the time, but this the, the next problem had to, was actually the traction system itself. So from the very beginning, uh, the concept of the train was that um, it would have a modular power system, modular traction architecture, if you like, um, which would essentially be future-proofed for uh, future technologies. So although at the time the focus was very much on uh, creating a diesel genset, um, it, the, the thought was always that in future they could be replaced by batteries or fuel cells or something else that doesn't exist yet. Um, but the first, uh, you know, the first step was the diesel 
diesel genset. Um, and this block diagram here just explains a little bit about the, the key elements of the diesel powered train. Um, and so each carriage um, retains its um, original bogies, but the uh, DC traction motors have now been replaced by AC traction motors. And um, that, the reason for that really is they're, A, they're more efficient, B, you can get uh, finer control with them, and C, uh, you can uh, do regenerative braking a lot more easily. So you can regenerate either uh, back into batteries, as we now do, or, um, well, certainly you can have dynamic braking through a, through a brake resistor. Um, and the, the motors were uh, sourced from Austria. They were essentially um, fit, form, and function the same uh, within the same envelope. And I mean, that was a project in itself, re retractioning. Um, then you have, uh, above that, you have the, uh, the TCU, the Traction Control Unit, which is provided by our friends in Holland, Structon, Structon Rail. And really, that's the brains of the train. That uh, receives the energy from, or the, the, the yeah, the energy from whatever source is available. Um, and obviously, in the case of the diesel genset version, it receives, um, it actually receives DC in, and then it chops that up and turns it into AC. By the way, I'm a mechanical engineer, so if I start talking rubbish about electrical stuff. That's, uh, I apologise, but um, it receives DC. So I'll start from the top. We have the the the, the engine, uh, which is a Ford engine. Uh, the Ford engine is actually an off-the-shelf engine, famously from the same engine that's in a Ford Ranger. Um, and the reason it's that is because Adrian Shooter drives one of them around, even still to this day. So he sort of said, well, if it, if it can produce this much power in my car, why can't it do the same on a, on a train? Um, so it's a Ford engine um, off-the-shelf. We had to provide the engine map for that. We had to do a completely new map because essentially Ford wouldn't warrant the engine for uh, rail use. So we had to develop an engine map, and we coupled it to a, um, a, a, a axial flux machine, which sounds very uh, futuristic, but it's a very high power density and high energy density machine, um, which um, obviously turns the rotational energy into electrical energy, um, uh, or three-phase electricity. <clears throat> and then through an inverter, it's changed into DC, and then the structure unit turns DC into AC and distributes it to the um, motors. Coming off all that, obviously, is the other uh, auxiliary circuits, uh, cooling and the like and that sort of thing. But that, that's the key architecture. So, um, and here's the here's the first one of the first gensets in the flesh, and a slightly more simple block diagram to illustrate um, what's going on in there. Um, the first genset was designed pretty much by a third party, but due to uh, the fire we had and various other issues, um, we soon, we real soon learned it was better to do the design in-house. Um, so what became the Mark II and Mark III gen sets that we're now on to um, is, all, is all essentially in-house design effort. Now, you can see in the bottom right there, or on, on the right, you can see um, an illustration of how maintenance friendly these gen sets are. Um, Famously, the train is designed to be uh, for an engine stop to be done in minutes. Uh, really, you can't do any maintenance on the gensets with the with the gensets in situ. They are forklift forklifted on and off. Uh, you don't need a pit for that. Um, they sit on four um, four pins, uh, and then there's some secondary retention to stop that if the pins were to fail, they would catch the genset. Um, and then you've got a, a electrical connection, and you've got a fuel connection. And uh, that's about it. So um, very simple plug and play concept. Um, and that has actually proved itself very, very valuable in service. Um, we did have a, a lot of widely, widely advertised problems in the first year of operation with the three trains at Bletchley. Um, and we did have a couple of instances where the train came back to Bletchley and uh, in, between, in between turns, it was taken into the depot, genset swap, and then it was back out again uh, without impacting the timetable. So <laughs> not that that was a really a good thing to, to have to deal with, but it did show the, the value of the concept in the first place. Now, um, a lot of the problems with the gen sets we've been pretty open about, um, not actually related to the engine itself. Um, a lot of people say, oh, it's the Ford engine, but it's, it's not at all, actually. Um, most of the problems have been around cooling, which if Roger Ford was on the call would probably make him smile, but there have been a lot of problems with cooling. Um, and 
uh, auxiliary systems, particularly the inverter and generally the software that's managing the whole thing. Um, but we're over that now. Um, we've had a year, well, over a year now to sort out the problems. Um, a lot of good work has gone into them. And just before uh, lockdown struck, the reliability on those units was, was really starting to climb again, I'm, I'm pleased to say. So um, the next image here, this is just showing how the gensets have evolved. Um, this is what you're looking into there is what we call the Mark II genset. What we did is we took the Mark I and based on the service experience from the first prototype train, uh, we, we completely reorganized the components, same components more or less, just reorganized in a much, much better fashion um, to make it more maintenance friendly, really, um, and to separate the hot parts of the engine from the cool parts of the engine. A lot of stuff that really should have been done, I suppose, on the first gen sets, but you learn, you know, this is all, this is, when you're moving fast to get into a market, you obviously you learn a lot of lessons along the way. So uh, the Mark II gen sets are what are now on the um, trains at Bletchley and also on the trains in North Wales, which I'll come to a bit later on. So the first actual prototype train was 230001. And that started off life as a simple two-car unit uh, with four gen sets. So each, each DM car has a traction control unit, two bogies, four traction motors, and two gen sets. Um, a bit later, we designed a middle car for it as well, which has a um, uh, CSI-compliant toilet on board and other toys. And um, that was the train <coughs> that um, we got mainline approval for in, I think, 2015 and had the unfortunate incident at, um, uh, near Kenilworth with the fire. But the, the lessons were quickly learned with that and built into um, the first three trains for, for, um, for Bletchley. I'm, I'm, I'm skipping forward a bit, but essentially 001, 230001 as the prototype became the basis for the first three trains, which were 230, 003, 4 and 5. And those three are, are now operating uh, on the Bedford Bletchley line. As, and, and I say that they are pure diesel electric vehicles, um, no batteries involved. And they, they was, delivery of them started in about the um, beginning of 2019. <clears throat> so um, on to batteries, which is now really the, the, the key uh, thing of interest now for everyone when you talk about Viva Rail. Um, <clears throat> in 2018, as everyone knows, the, uh, the challenge was laid down by Joe Johnson about decarbonizing the railways, um, getting rid of diesel trains by 2040. And um, you know, whether or not that ambition is ever going to be met, I don't know. But uh, this changed the, the course of uh, sort of V-Rail's focus. <clears throat> and um, we uh, managed to obtain a grant uh, to develop a battery version of our train. Now, the picture you're looking at there, that obviously isn't a Class 230. That was um, uh, probably the last battery train, or pure battery train, if you like, as in it's not a hybrid train. Obviously, there was the the class 379 IPEMU trial in um, about six years ago, which Bombardier did, um, which was a, obviously um, the, the core of the train was a, a Pantograph uh, electric train, but with some onboard batteries. But prior to that, British Rail had experimented with um, uh, battery trains um, with this uh, Derby lightweight unit converted. And you can see the size of the battery box. These are all lead acid batteries. Um, and I think this must have been in the 60s or 70s. Someone, I'm sure someone will correct me. Um, I think it was a fairly short-lived trial. Um, but the unit itself survives in preservation up at the um, up in Scotland. Um, so you can, I think it's the Royal Deeside Railway. So you can still go and see that. I don't think it works on batteries anymore, but uh, it's good to know it's been preserved. So I don't actually state claim to Vivrail being the first the first train the first uh, manufacturer to do a battery train. Obviously we weren't, and before that there was even older examples going back into the early 20th century. Um, anyway, so this is this is 230002, our second prototype train. And what you're looking at there in the inset, that is um, that is the battery raft. And we actually inherited the batteries from the IPEMU trial. Um, the batteries being supplied by a company called Valence, which became Lithium Works. Um, and Within those batteries there, you've got cylindrical cells. So I suppose very much like big AA, big AA batteries, really. And we packaged it into a um, the same sort of raft as a, as a diesel genset. So again, the mechanical uh, interface is exactly the same. And the electrical interface is a bit different. 
uh, and obviously there's no fuel required. Um, but again, you've got forklift pocket pockets under there, so battery rafts can be changed pretty quickly. Not that you actually need to, because obviously the batteries are um, designed to be uh, not changed regularly, like a genset would be. Um, and um, each raft itself is around about 100 kilowatt hours of um, of energy. So 23002 was uh, put together, funded through Innovate UK, and um, finished in 2018, and taken up to the um, Preserve Railway in Scotland, whose name currently eludes me. But it was very well received. It's a very simple train, really. Um, Interior-wise, it's as it was in LUL days, really, with a few minor uh, improvements. Um, but what was most striking, I think, about the trial um, from the feedback we've had is that, uh, you know, that that railway there has got some pretty stiff gradients, and, and that thing was able to accelerate and keep accelerating up the hill um, at a pretty pretty high rate of knots. Um, one meters per second squared is the the limit at which we have to stop, really, because if you go any if you if you if the acceleration is any higher than that, you start knocking people off their feet. So um, it was well received, um, fully loaded. It could you know flash up the hill, and it really showed the value of of the electric drive and and, and the batteries in the powertrain. So I think that caught everyone's attention. Um, at the time, that train there has to be charged with a big uh, umbilical cord. Um, but what we are now working on, and what I'll come on to, is um, is uh, fast charging. Anyway, in, in the meantime, we had to go. We had to take a slight diversion into hybridisation. Um, 23002 built originally as a two-car battery-only train. Um, we then got an order from uh, Transport for Wales for um, five three-car uh, diesel battery hybrid trains. And the reason they were interested in diesel battery hybrids is that well, principally to cut down emissions in built-up areas. So these, the, the, the concept is that you can um, motor along with the gensets running, providing the range extension for the batteries. Um, and the gensets themselves are what we call geofenced, so that when you get near to a station, uh, they, they cut out. Well, in fact, they don't cut out. They, they go down to idle, but they could be cut out. Um, and you can go in and out of the station on batteries alone. Now, this is in many respects, not just because of uh, cutting down emissions in built-up areas, but it's also much kinder on the gensets. Um, on the on the Bedford Bletchley units, they're running at about, uh, I think it's uh, two and a half thousand RPM, uh, and of course they the, the cyclic loading on the engines is pretty severe because they are providing direct power to the motors. Whereas on the hybrid unit that you're looking at here, um, the gensets more or less keep going around about sort of two thousand RPM. And that's very much kinder to the engines and, and all the auxiliary components. Um, and as it is now proving that the gensets are being a lot more reliable because of the fact we're not subjecting them to the same um, same sort of arduous duty cycle. What you have for the power hybrid train is, is formed. So you have the original battery driving motor cars, one at each end. And essentially, our product platform now is that the DM cars stay pretty much the same. We don't really want to touch the design of them. They will always carry the batteries, the, tra the traction motors, the TCU. And then you have in the middle, um, you can play tunes really. You, you, you have what we're calling the hybrid trailer car. And that acts as the power station. So it's currently configured in this view for diesel gensets. But in future, um, it, can be a, it can be a pantograph car, it can be a fuel cell car, uh, or in fact, just carries more batteries. Now, we have this year um, done some work on the 25 kV version, um, which for several reasons is currently paused. Um, but we did, we've done six or seven months worth of development work on a 25 kV battery version. Um, but what you're looking at in the picture here, this is the this is 23002 with a, with, a, with a middle car inserted. And we use this as the test bed for the five trains that we're now delivering to, to North Wales. And we took that out on the main line for the first time uh, in last summer, in 2019. Now, what we could also do with this train, we could we could actually run it in battery-only mode. So that gave us lots of useful data into how the trains perform as battery-only vehicles. And we found that we could do, in a three-car configuration, um, around about 40 miles on battery alone. And 
when you do the calculations, when you take it back to a two-car train, you can actually do 60 miles on battery alone, um, which is not, not all too bad, really. Here's just a picture of 230002 out on the main line. I quite like it because it's a battery train in um, Great Western Railway setting, semaphore signals. It just sort of serves to highlight the uh, juxtaposition of, of our railway system it's in, in, in a good way. So the hybrid trains for uh, North Wales, this is some uh, computer generated images. Um, and you can see that we not only did we um, not only was this the first deployment of a hybrid drive system, but there were also lots of lovely interior uh, improvements to make. We designed a, um, a walkthrough gangway, a wider gangway there. Um, we, did, we, we introduced some new seating, uh, some of the sort of high-backed um, aerial um, airline-style seating. We introduced new graph screens, overhead luggage racks, and so there's an awful lot of new design that went into these. And this was the this was the result. This is a, a a real interior shot of the first train. And if you can ignore the Henry Hoover in the background, um, I think well we're, we're all pretty proud of this. Really, that, that that looks like a new train, and it's been very well received by the user groups, um, who obviously ultimately and the customers who ultimately matter the most, um, but also by Transport for Wales, who I think were, um, I suppose quite quite pleasantly surprised by what we've delivered. So. The first two trains are now up at Birkenhead doing their um, final mileage accumulation. Um, the final three trains uh, are on their way very shortly. I think the last train is due to be delivered in late October. Um, and they'll be operating the Wrexham Bidston service and possibly also the Crew Chester line as well. I think originally they were going to operate the uh, Lundubno Junction to Blenheim Pistiniog line, but I think that's not happening anymore for some reason. Okay, so that brings us really up to date with where we are with our with our products. Um, and in the background, we've been working uh, very hard on automatic fast charging. Now, there's no point really having a battery train if you have to stop for four hours to charge the batteries, or if you have to use a forklift to change the batteries, and you can only do 60 miles. From the very beginning, um, we, we set out to design a train that could meet the same um, timetable, really, timetable pattern as any other train i.e. when it gets to a terminus station, it really hasn't got to stop for more than five or ten minutes. Um, doesn't have to be, uh, you know, haven't got to be plugged in uh, manually by anyone, so there's no, we, we didn't want to have to risk, uh, bring risk, you know, impart risk by having to, um, having some, having to get down to the track side and, and plug in the batteries. So we've been developing a fast charge system um, and the way this works is that the, well, I should probably, it's easier to explain with a, um, no, I'll talk about this slide. The, the batteries themselves, as I said before, can do, or can, can propel a train for around 60 miles, two car train, before they need charging. Um, and the, the engineering limitations, obviously, to charging batteries are how much charge you can get back into the battery in a short space of time. Obviously, the more, Charge you try and the more charge you try and force into a battery, uh, the the more heat you generate, and really the dissipation of the heat is the limiting factor. So you need batteries that can actually receive charge fast uh, and can dissipate the heat. Um, you also need the equipment, uh, the infrastructure, to connect with the trains. So uh, the concept is that you have um, charging stations along the route. And the charging stations consist of um, a, an energy store, i.e. A, a big battery bank on the line side, or well, not necessarily on the line side, but um, you know, in a car park or something, uh, or just to one side. Train comes along um, and uh, recognizes, the system recognizes that it's the right train uh, in the right place and um, energizes some, um, some short sections of uh, third and fourth rail. Um, shoe gear is deployed, or shoe gear engages with the third and fourth rail sections, and after a bit of a safety handshake, um, the uh, the battery bank is energised and it charges the batteries on the train. Now, to achieve that, I'll go to the next picture. We've had to work um, with a company called Hoppecker, Germany, on developing the battery technology. So first and foremost, as I said, you need the batteries that can receive the charge, and the new 
batteries, these, these aren't the ones that are on the, uh, the Welsh units. The Welsh units are uh, essentially using the same batteries that were on the IPEMU, so they don't need fast charge. Th those are essentially trickle charged by the gensets. Um, but, we, but, for, but for doing a, a pure battery train with fast charge, we needed something different. So we worked with Hopica to develop um, these new batteries. And these new batteries um, uh, have a different type of cell chemistry and a different type of cell makeup. And they have their own inbuilt um, air conditioning or HVAC system. And obviously, the HVAC system takes away the heat, which is generated by having to charge them very quickly. I'm not going to say any more than that, but you can just see in the block diagram, block diagram above um, a reflection of what I showed you earlier in the picture with the driving motor cars, which have the batteries, and the middle car. Um, well, in this case, it's shown as having more batteries, um, but it illustrates the point that um, uh, you, can have, you can fill up the train with batteries and you can have fast charge pickup on all three cars. That's the intention. Um, and then you're not constrained, really. Uh, well, the, the only constraint is, is the ability of the charging station to deliver um, the amount of charge you need in the time you need. This is an image of the, um, of the experimental charging station. Now, what you'll see there in the foreground is actually a massive diesel genset. Now, that's the only reason for that is because it makes the lorry trailer portable. So we take the, the, the container in the background contains a lot of batteries um, and some switch gear. And then the, uh, the big generator in the foreground obviously charges the batteries. This is what we took to Scotland with 002. And we connected the lorry trailer to, the, to, the, to 002. Uh, to charge the to charge the train, and that wasn't fast charging. That was that was just um, essentially slow charging, just to just to demonstrate that you can what a battery train looked like. But in future, if you imagine that the genset, the, the big genset there, is replaced by well, it can be anything really. It can be solar panels. It can be a connection to the national grid. Uh, it could be a wind farm. And of course, the advantage of that is that you can uh, you can use the the, the, the batteries. In, in the charging station uh, as, a, as a buffer. Um, obviously, in areas where you've got a lot of renewable uh, energy, um, one of the problems is uh, fluctuations in demand and also fluctuations in supply. And quite often they have to obviously uh, lock. I suppose if there's too much wind, basically you, you have to stop the turbines. And if there's too much wind um, or, or too little wind, they're, not, they're no use at all. Um, so National Grid or uh, well, the energy suppliers are very keen uh, to find ways of, of buffering um, the renewable energy inputs to the system, and battery banks would be a very good way of doing that. Uh, and then, then you can use the energy to, to charge your trains as, as you need to. This just illustrates what's inside the big blue container, the switch gear and the, and the racks of batteries. And I, I said I, I mentioned before, it's got a quite a sophisticated handshaking uh, system to make sure that you don't try and automatically charge the wrong train uh, or make obviously the, the the third and fourth rail which is what you can see in this view here most of the time the third and fourth rail there uh, which is surrounded by the yellow barge boarding is is dead when there's no train around that that that, that third and fourth rail is is not live it's all it's all earthed um, and that again makes it inherently safe the reason it's got a fence around it here, a long mast, long mast, is because the landlords were worried about their dogs getting electrocuted. Um, and we, we kept telling them there's no risk. that <laughs> The train has to be on top of the third and fourth rail, um, but they insisted on a fence. But the system is inherently safe. Uh, and um, this is now the system that we're trying to get um, uh, adopted by Network Rail. Uh, we are actually in the, last, in the final throes of getting it certified for use. And uh, once we've got it certified, We'll be in a much better position to um, deploy this, hopefully somewhere in the UK, or maybe not, maybe somewhere abroad. Um, and we hope this will generate an awful lot of interest in fast charge battery trains. And we think we're the only company that can do this at the moment, all developed in the UK by a very small team of people. Now, slight diversion into the Isle of Wight contract. Um, we bid for this on the basis of providing battery trains. And one of the benefits of battery trains would have been that the, uh, the third rail infrastructure on the island wouldn't have needed upgrading. Um, it could have been essentially uh, uh, scrapped when the infrastructure was life expired. But 
probably quite rightly so for political reasons i think um the uh, the option was taken to upgrade the third rail upgrade the substations all that because i suppose the risk is that battery trains might not be around forever um so once you've got electrification it's best to hold on to it so at the last minute we found we were designing third rail electric trains rather than battery trains um and we are now building five of those which will be two car emus um <laughs> bit of a shame it's not a fourth rail system on the island because they could have just had d78s with a bit of an upgrade but um it's sort of come full circle um and we are re reusing the um original d78 pickup apparatus um it just happens to be only the positive rail uh, rather than the negative rail um but the the traction control unit is very similar to what we've had previously uh, the motors are the same um and it just illustrates the flexibility of the of the product and the first three the first three trains are supposed to be delivered to the island by the end of this year ready for the blockade um, and you'll probably all know that the existing d78 uh, sorry 1938 stock is very much life expired it's the oldest uh, rolling stock fleet in the country probably the world in regular day, -day service um, but at times it's down to one operating unit and sometimes not even that so it's well overdue uh, an upgrade. For those who wonder about how the D78 is gauge cleared on the island, they are gauge cleared, I can assure you that because I've done the work myself or <laughs> managed the work myself. Um, the pinch point is not actually right St John's Tunnel, it's one of the overbridges um, between the tunnel and the depot. But nonetheless, the track is being uh, fettled slightly to make sure they fit. Just to round off our product development, um, about 18 months ago, the reason I joined VivaRail was to um, take forward the hydrogen development aspect of it. Um, uh, <laughs> did that job for a month, um, and then I was offered the chance to be chief engineer, which got me into everything else. But at what, where we got to with this, um, again, using the using the modular concept of the uh, driving motor cars having the batteries on board. Um, and then the middle vehicles become the hydrogen storage vehicles and the fuel cell vehicles. Now, we were trying to, or we are trying to develop, and we still are in the background doing a bit of work on this, but we, we're trying to develop a, a concept whereby we don't have to put any of the hydrogen um, uh, above the sole bar or on the roof. Now, obviously, on the roof is problematic because of gauge restrictions, um, and in the saloon is even more problematic because you lose seats. Obviously, you're supposed to if you want paying passengers, then you need to give them some seats. Uh, so we, we believe in trying to keep everything underneath. This, of course, raises its own challenges uh, in terms of impact protection and derailment protection. And these are challenges which, quite frankly, we haven't really got into yet. Um, our main thrust now, it has to be said, is, is providing battery trains. We, we have moved away from hydrogen. We are, I say, we're still keeping the project going in the background, um, but there are several problems with hydrogen, one being the uh, amount of hydrogen you have to carry. Uh, it's something like you need eight times as much hydrogen by volume uh, to, uh, to achieve the same energy, um, energy carried as you would with diesel, uh, which means you have to store the hydrogen at very high pressure, 350 bar typically. Um, and there is a physical limit as to how much hydrogen you can carry. Um, and just like everybody else, we've come up against that problem and we're trying to solve it. But it does give you, there is a, physics does actually limit um, the utility of hydrogen trains. And um, uh, that's not to say there's not a place for them. Um, and if you want emission, totally emission free, well, not totally emission free because you still have to produce the hydrogen, which is energy intensive. But if you want emission free at the point of use, then the hydrogen train is still a valid thing. Um, but we are placing, as VivaRail, we are placing a lot more emphasis now on batteries and fast charge. And the reason for that, um, as I said before, is you, you can carry more uh, energy on board with the batteries. You have, and you can, and the actual infrastructure required to support the trains, the fast charging station is quite a lot simpler and safer, probably, than, um, than hydrogen. And overall, when you think of well, well to wheel, as they say, um, we we have calculated that battery trains are quite a lot more efficient than, than doing it with hydrogen. So 
not to say we're not going to do a hydrogen train, but it's um, it's lower down the pecking order now than than batteries. And that's a bit about fuel cells, which I won't go into. We have and we are working with um, a company called Arcola Energy, who some of you might have heard of. Uh, the reason for that is they are um, they are very experienced fuel cell um, integrators. Uh, they've done it on buses. They are doing it on buses in Liverpool, and we recognise that we as Viverail don't have any particular hydrogen experience, so we um, we signed a sort of arrangement with them uh, to to develop our train with them. Now, <laughs> just to finish off, um, one very off the wall um, uh, collaboration that we've been getting involved with is actually related to hydrogen, uh, but in a, in a very different way. Uh, a company called Steamology um, approached us at a Innovate UK uh, event back in 2018 and um, got got me rather excited about their technology. And I said, yeah, well, we'll, we'll get involved in a, in a bid um, to Innovate UK for some of their first of a kind funding. Um, little did I expect that they would actually win, um, but they did. Um, and their technology actually starts with the, uh, believe it or not, the um, British land speed record attempt for a steam car. Um, back in whenever it was, 20, 20, 2009, I think it was, um, they developed a steam, they, they set out to challenge the world, world land speed record for steam car, uh, which had been held since about 1920 by a Stanley steamer car and had never been, never been beaten. Well, steamology technology, you basically take hydrogen and oxygen and you essentially directly combust it in, in what only, I can only describe as a sort of rocket chamber. Um, and you create superheated steam. And then you feed the superheated steam through a turbine, and then you hook the turbine up to a, uh, an alternator, and then you create electrical power. Um, so we, having got the money, we, we gave them the challenge of, of packaging their technology into our, into our raft, which you can see in the bottom corner there, bottom right corner or middle right. Um, that, was the, that's, that was the result. And in there you have uh, two, the orange, sort of bullet looking things, well they are called bullets and that's the steam generator. Um, the steam generator goes through a turbine, the turbine um, uh, goes through a single stage uh, reduction gearbox, um, I think it's six to one or 60 to one, um, and that turns the, uh, the very large alternator, which is the big blue thing. And then the alternator through a rectifier produces uh, DC and then obviously we would have the next step would have been to put that on our on our train. The image of the carriage on the left there shows how uh, where the where the gen set would be and hydrogen and oxygen probably not arranged like that because that's hydrogen tanks next to oxygen tanks, which is a very bad idea. But that was the the first concept. And um, there obviously would have been a lot of work to do to get that approved, convince um, the relevant authorities that it was safe. But as an interesting aside. Um, it, it, it proved that it was possible to do um, something very different indeed. And Seamology went on to get further uh, funding from uh, First of a Kind in, in Rate UK, and they've gone on to, well, they're, they're doing other projects now, um, but we still keep in touch, as it were, um, and there's no, nothing to say we couldn't pursue this in, in future. So um, that's really the end of my presentation, the whirlwind tour of Beaver Rail, where we are and where we're going. Um, I guess it's over to any questions. Thanks, Dave. That was um, that was excellent. Yeah, very informative, interesting. Um, and I'm sure there will be some questions generated as a result of that. So I've just gone on to the Q and A panel at the uh, at the bottom right. And just for anyone who's uh, who's still not totally clear on the Q and A process. Uh, at the bottom of your screen, there should be a an option to there's a Q and A uh, button. It's next to the chat and participants. Yep. If you go into there, you can um, uh, people are able to just type a question. It will come up. I will uh, I'll officiate uh, and we'll run down and we'll get through as many as we can. We've got sort of 10 or 15 minutes to 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 take any questions. There's a couple of uh, a couple that have already been put up. The first one is from Andy Batters. It's not so much a question. He's, uh, he's put up a link to a Wikipedia page uh, just confirming the, the British Rail battery electric multiple unit and just opening the page while I was listening to Dave talking. 
just uh, just letting everyone know that there was this this particular train was developed and commenced running in 1958 through to 1966. So that was the ah, uh, than I thought. Yeah. Reason why. So yeah. Um, so that link. Um, and anyone who's interested, well, you can Google it, and uh, and it's on Wikipedia. British Rail, BMU, for anyone who's interested. Right, the next question that's, uh, that's on the list is from Liz Lockwood. So her question is, Dave, you can probably read it yourself, but for everyone else, you spoke about the crashworthiness of the exterior cra cab, but what steps were taken to ensure that the interior crashworthiness met the latest standards? And likewise, same question for fire performance. Okay, yes. Well, in terms of the interior crashworthiness, um, we always started from the basis that these were um, approved trains for use on LUL. So anything we did to them had to be uh, essentially the same, not, not to, um, what's the word? We, wouldn't, we weren't allowed to do anything that would make performance of the trains in whatever area any worse. So the original interior of 230001 was the same interior as as they came out of service on LUL. So in that sense, there was no no change. But subsequently, when we've designed the interior for the Welsh the Welsh units, for example, um, when we've uh, for, for for the new seats and tables that we've had there, we've they, they've been put through the full uh, crash simulation um, uh, uh, stops, which is a, I think it's a program called LS Dina, and that, so they are fully compliant to the latest crashworthiness standards. Um, it's the same for the new draft screens. We're also very um, we're very careful to ensure that there aren't any you know sharp edges or anything that could be act as a as a blade in the event of uh, uh, people being flung around the compartment. Um, so yes, initially uh, relying on on grandfather grandfather rights if you like, uh, or as in we wouldn't do anything to make it worse. Um, but latterly, we've, we've everything complies to um, latest crashworthiness standards. Fire performance is a similar thing. Um, the original D78 trains were essentially designed to the very highest standards of fire performance because they were running in long sections of tunnels. So the philosophy, again, when they came to us, was that we would either replace materials like for like, i.e., the performance was no was, was always better or no worse. Um, and any new materials introduced would have to comply or do comply with EM45545. I think I've got that right. And I think according to that standard, we are OC3 to that to that level. I hope, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I think that's uh, that sounds like I'm sure Liz will uh, will come back if there's anything else she wants to wants to know. Right, the next question uh, on the list is. Um, on the hybrid units, why doesn't the diesel gen set shut down altogether in urban areas? You mentioned that it goes idle. Yeah, at the I moment, said it has the option you could shut it down, but I guess the question is, is there any reason why it doesn't shut down altogether? Um, the main reason at the moment is reliability. We are very nervous about the, with having had all the gen set reliability issues last year, um, we are nervous about engines shutting them down because that, uh, that means um, more cycles on the starter motor, for example. Um, there's startup issues to consider as well with the software. So at the moment, it's, they're not shut down completely for reliability reasons. But I think in due course, when we get a bit more brave with them, a bit more confidence with them, we can certainly um, look to shut them down completely. <clears throat> okay, thank you. The next question, um, with the current technology, what are you achieving for battery life? Or, or probably more, relevant, you know, more accurately, what's your forecast for battery life? based on the data so far? Yep, uh, based on the data so far, um, about seven years for, for batteries. But that doesn't mean the whole battery rafts are completely written off or scrapped at the end of it. Um, I, from what I gather, they're about 90% um, recyclable. So obviously the raft itself, which is metalwork, would be reused. Uh, the battery cells are reprocessed, so a lot, an awful lot of material is recovered. Um, and that's all predicated on, if that's the right word, on keeping them between 80% and 20% uh, state of charge. So seven, seven years is the nominal life at the moment, but we haven't proven that yet, and we will prove that over, over time. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Next question is, uh, was there any train actually designed on the steamology hydrogen concept? Not really, no, other than what you see on the screen in front of you, which was a, a CAD 
which is a, a CAD layout really, nothing more than that. We haven't got as far as designing a train with that yet. We were, we were mostly trying to prove that we, how, how much um, how much hydrogen and oxygen we could store. So we were placing cylinders into the model just to see where we could fit them, where we could squeeze them. Obviously one of the problems with cylinders is that they're cylindrical and they're not the most um, efficient use of space. There's lots of interstitial, interstitial spaces. So if there's a company out there that can design an irregular box that can that can carry 350 bar of hydrogen, then I'd like to hear from them. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Right, thanks. Right, okay, so the next one. Um, this is from Andrew Harvey. Did you fit an axle earth return to the bogey as part of the fast charging project? And did that enable you to run on third rail for the Isle of Wight? Ah, yes. So for the fast charge train, the earth return is back through the... You've got two rails. Uh, I don't know if you saw in the picture, but you've got... I'll just reverse a little bit. Um, you've got two rails, and one rail is positive and one rail is negative. So you don't actually need to return the current through the running rails. Yeah. Because that, that utilises the, the original third and fourth rail pickup shoes. Hmm. If, you, if we were doing this on a on, on not a D78 train, uh, we would have to design uh, a, new, a new arrangement for the shoe gear, but the principle would be the same. We, we don't want to send the return current back through the rails. If it, we, it, we, have, we, have safety, we have safety provisions in, in case that happens, um, but we don't, that's, that's not the way it's designed. Okay, that's interesting, yep. Next question on the list is, how does the battery charging equipment detect the presence of the correct train? It is through a, um, it is through a proximity sensor. You, on that picture there, you can't see it, but it picks up the proximity sensors, I think, pick up where the axle ends are. And then there's a, then there's a Wi-Fi connection that communicates between the train. Every train has essentially got a Wi-Fi tag, um, R, sorry, RFID tag. And that tells the uh, mm -hmm. charging station that it's the right train. Yeah. And it's also good for energy metering because it means that you can track how much energy is going into each train and apportion it. Mm. Very good. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay. Next one's from George Fletcher. He says, oh, "Thank you for thank you for the presentation." Um, you mentioned three locations in the UK that are about to are or, or will be in service shortly. Um, have you got anywhere else that you're expecting to have contracts for for these vehicles? Um, <laughs> I couldn't possibly divulge, but certainly there's been a lot of interest from lots of operators um, all over the UK, ranging from Scotland to Wales to the southwest. So we very much hope that we'll get some more orders. We haven't got any orders beyond Isle of Wight at the moment. So if there's any operators listening, please give us an order. <laughs> um, they're very good trains. Um, 60 mile an hour top speed, this is the sales pitch. Um, and you've seen what we can do with, with fast charge and I say we're very close to getting that approved. So we can in fact uh, provide the complete solution, not just the battery train, but the, the charging stations. And, and what we're also increasingly getting interest now is uh, retractioning other people's trains. So what we're trying to move away from is we're not just, we're not just purveyors of class 230s. Um, we are purveyors of battery technology and charging technology. And we are getting a lot of interest now from uh, vehicle owners, Roscoe's, um, uh, both here and abroad, about applying the technology we've developed to other people's trains. And we have a very, well, a very live uh, potential order for an overseas country. And if we got that, um, it will essentially use up all the class 230 vehicles. And then, then we'll be left with a nice problem to have, which is what, what do we do next? <laughs> we, need, we need more donor vehicles. <laughs> so good luck with that. Yeah. Uh, next question is, uh, I'll just paraphrase it. Uh, how fast is fast charging? You did sort of talk about that in your presentation. Just to clarify, are, are you achieving the, um, the, the sort of service uh, turnaround requirements that you were aiming, you, know, you, you were building your fast charging model on? So we are aiming for a fully replenished batteries in 10 minutes. Um, and the calculations show that's possible. Um, we haven't proven that yet at scale. The, uh, the picture you're still looking at there, that, that is not a full scale fast charge station. And once we get approval to deploy the, 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 uh, the fast charger on network rail, uh, we will look to 
um, partner with somebody to, to build the first full-scale prototype, and then we can actually validate the calculations. But the, the data we've uh, data we've achieved, the data we've received or, or got off this uh, prototype. Um, and also some of the data we've got from the running of uh, 23002 in hybrid mode um, has given us confidence that we can achieve a 10 minute um, charge time. And obviously you can have it, it can be shorter than that, but you don't have a fully replenished battery. And it, and it depends on the state of or how, how, de how depleted the batteries are in the first place. Mm. And, um, but what, what we will do is work with operators to, uh, we, we have the simulation tools, we can work out where best to put the charging stations, how many you need, what size they need to be, um, et cetera, et cetera, to, to operate a, a service any, for any, any given diagram. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, thank you. Next question is, what is the weight difference between the diesel gen set and the battery rafts? The uh, battery rafts, each one weighs about 1.7 tonnes, and a diesel gen set uh, started off at about 900 kilos, and has now crept up to, uh, on the Mark III version, it's crept up to about 1.3 tonnes. Mm. Um, the reason for that is we've used, we use, we're now using a much simpler alternator with diesel gen sets, but it's a lot heavier. Um, we're calling that our Mark III. The engine's the same, but the, the alternator is, is a big, chunky, but much more reliable thing. Mm. So, well, actually, I'll, just, I'll, just, I'll, I'll take the opportunity to start a question myself on that then. I mean, just as a result of that, and you, you mentioned the uh, sort of bogey work earlier, but have you had to do anything in terms of suspension um, as a result of that? And are there any limitations on axle loading in, in, or, or all the dynamic movement of the vehicle, you know, maintaining um, gauge clearance with the extra weight that you've put on at different points around the vehicle? Yes, I mean, we've certainly had to um, reassess the dynamics and reassess the weight distribution and the car body uh, strength. We were lucky enough to have on board um, one of the original engineers involved with the D78 stock in the first place when it was designed at Metcam. And he was able to dig out the original calculations, original strain gauge tests, results, and everything we've subsequently done to the trains has been um, essentially approved, well, essentially run, run, past, run past him. So although we've um, added more mass to the underframe, um, we, we have assumed lower passenger loading because uh, they were originally designed for a very high passenger loading, being underground trains. Um, but now they're deployed on the main line, the, uh, the crush loading is not as bad. So we've traded, we've traded crush loading for tear weight, if you like. And the overall the, the, the net effect is that we haven't, um, we haven't exceeded the structural capability of the body shell or the bogies or the axles. So we, we're very conscious to keep the weight within the original design. Mm. Yeah, okay, that's interesting. Okay, we've got time for just a few more questions. I'll just keep going down the list. Um, the next one is, why is a battery pack used for fast charging rather than direct charging from the mains via a rectifier system? Why is, okay, um, you mean why is having onboard batteries better than just having uh, a battery charger on the side of the track? I think I'd like to it's trying to, I'm just reading the question out as it is. Um, as battery users, yeah, I'll reread it again. Why, why is a battery pack used for fast charging rather than direct charging from the mains via? I see. I see. Yes. 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 Okay. Well, you have to deliver a lot of charge in a very short space of time, and that that requires very high currents. Now, if yeah. we just took those currents out of the national grid, we would, it wouldn't be very, it wouldn't be, it would be frowned upon. <laughs> it would create some yeah. problems. So we have to have that buffer in the middle, and as I previously explained, it's also it's also good from the point of view of they, the, the the battery charging stations can be trickle charged over yeah. time, uh, through a variety of means. So it acts as a buffer for national grid, but it also allows us to, to deliver the high currents we need without having a detrimental impact on the national grid. Yeah, absolutely. And as you were saying, using um, using sort of renewable energy sources, yeah, you know, accounting for peaks and troughs to get a smoother smoother flow. So yeah, very good. Yeah. Okay. There's a message from Liz Lockwood who asked one of the early questions. Yeah. Thank you. That that answer you gave was was fine. Thank you. Yeah. With regards to fast charging, how does how does this efficiency compare with standard charging? Is the next question. Uh, I think it's difficult to compare. Stand, standard charging by that we mean probably um, slow charging. Um, slow charging at the moment with the batteries that are on the Welsh units. Um, 
and the batteries that are on the original 23002 prototype, they have to be balance charged. And balance charging means that you have to uh, even out the voltage in all the cells. Um, and you have to do that pretty slowly over overnight. And the problem with that is, it's, you know, that, that's not really very operator friendly. Um, if the cells go out of balance, um, you have to spend a lot of time. Eventually, the, the, the battery raft will stop functioning because everything's out of balance. Um, so you have to spend a lot of time back in the depot rebalancing them. Um, I, I couldn't really answer the question about how the efficiency of slow charging compares with fast charging. Yeah. The, the, the fast charge batteries, the Hopica batteries, um, balance themselves um, sort of in real time. So I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that question. That's, that's okay. I wouldn't expect you to. Right, there's then uh, an, a, another comment from uh, Colin Babcook, uh, another historical comment actually, just making the note that Ireland had two battery trains known, known as the drum battery trains, which operated on the Dublin to Bray line from 1932 to 1949, so a bit more history there. Fantastic. Uh, and he personally rode on a, on, a, on a battery train in Germany uh, in 1962 and makes the comment it was very slow uphill, so the, uh, the battery technology certainly improved since then. Yes. Um, another question from Liz. Uh, she's saying, "How are you going to get the vehicles onto the Isle of Wight? Because the uh, she's heard that the quayside is not suitable for unloading. Uh, and also they've got trains on the Isle of Wight, so there was a mechanism for getting them on there in the first place. But uh, yes, they will go on a low loader, and the low loader goes on the ferry, and I think the ferry goes to." Uh, I'm not quite sure where, but it's all it's all doable basically. Yeah. The idea is they get delivered to Sandown, uh, which is one of the intermediate stations where there's a little um, engineer's yard. Uh, well, it's, it's the remains of the old bay platform. They get delivered there. They'll have to get winched off the lorry, and then we have to be uh, essentially manoeuvred onto the main line and then either either dragged down to Wright St John's depot or by one of the 483s or uh, driven under their own steam, if you like. But it's something we're working through at the moment. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, very good, very good. Well, I've got two more questions, and then we'll we'll wrap up the Q and A uh, part of this. So, um, the penultimate question: Have you developed a suitable impact protected arrangement for the hydrogen trains? Not yet. Right. Okay. Perhaps though. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Short, short, and sweet. And the final final uh, comment is from Andy Roberts, who also comments on uh, it being a great presentation. Uh, did you have any industrial relations issues with the new stock in terms of convincing people of the safety of the train? And he mentions particularly crashworthiness. Uh, I don't think I don't think we had industrial relations issues with the crashworthiness. We did have industrial relations issues with the design of the new cab, as every manufacturer finds. And we 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 have worked very closely with Aslef in particular to make it as left friendly and all, all few, essentially all trains have the same cab that's now been approved in inverted commas by as left but as everyone knows uh, an approved as left cab is never fully approved every, every train operator every set of new drivers wants something a bit different so it's simply we have to go through um the island line drivers for example wanted a few extras here and there fair enough um but i don't think there's been any particular concerns over crashworthiness now okay well, thanks, Dave, for that. That was a, a comprehensive set of questions and answers, which you took very well, so thank you. I will now hand over to Dave Coxon, if he's, uh, if he's right, ready, uh, and Dave will just do a vote of thanks. Thank you, uh, Jason. Um, I find this a fascinating talk, um, and as we all know, I thought it's either the ugly duckling turning into a swan, or people laughing at Christopher Columbus because when the Viva Rail started out with the D78 conversion, as David said in his talk, they were derided, it would never work, and um, they proved eventually, despite some setbacks of fires, etc., uh, they proved that it did work and it would work, and then they went on to develop even better trains. Now. I'm fascinated by David's talk. There's a lot of information I wasn't aware of. The general press and the railway press obviously don't always get hold of these things. But to sum up, I think it was a in very interesting talk, and I'm very pleased that Viva Rail has progressed to where they are today. 
I'm sure they've got a very bright future. And when Mr. Horton in charge, it'll be even brighter. And I, um, I won't ask for a round of applause, but uh, give it your Thank life in arms. But thanks a lot, David. Very interesting. Pleasure. Thank you very much, everyone. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Thank you to me. No, thank, thanks all. Thanks to Dave for the vote of thanks, and thanks, Dave, for the thing. Um, just before we do a final sign-off, um, uh, I just want to just mention the... Uh, well, first of all, I hope the arrangements have been satisfactory for everyone tonight. I mean, certainly from where I've been sitting in the computer I've been using, the uh, it all seems to have worked very well. The Q&A process has worked. Now we've done one. I'm sure we'll be more effective la next time. Um, if anyone did have any issues or, uh, or or has got any comments on ways to improve how we're doing this, please do get in touch with the, the committee. You can make contact through the website, uh, the uh, the railway division uh, Midland Centre page, which you can find, or um, or you can just contact one of the committee members uh, directly if you've got uh, got our contact details. Um, I will just finally mention the next lecture, which is on Monday the 12th of October. Um, so it's about four weeks time. That's uh, Mersey Rail um, New Trains. It's going to be delivered by David Powell, who's the Programme Director of Rolling Stock at Mersey Travel. So it's on his new trains, uh, the, the new train programme they've got, with, but with a particular focus on the platform train interface and the systems approach that they've taken to, uh, to get the PTI uh, working well. And that's a joint lecture with the, the Permanent Way Institution. So with a final thank you for Dave for an excellent presentation um, that concludes the proceedings for this evening. Thank you very much. Thanks again. Jason, I think that went all right. Yeah, I think so. I think we've just got as as Dave gone. We've got a couple of um, we've still got a couple of attendees on, which is fine. We should just do a quick wrap up uh, for um. You know, unfortunately, Dave's dialed off. We could have had a quick quick chat with him. But yeah, it was excellent. Looks like she's on mute. Oh yes. I'll drop David a David note actually. Yeah. <laughs> very interesting as well, actually. Very good. It seemed to work okay, didn't it? I thought that went really well. I, yeah. I, I must say earlier in the day I wasn't um relishing the thought of sitting for another hour and a half in front of the computer having started before I just and being solid today. But uh but actually that was okay, it was quite interesting and it worked really well. Yeah, no, I thought it was excellent. Good. Good. Sorry, I was here. Um, right. I'm back. No, thank you um, so much. That's good. That went really well. No, thanks. Thanks for all your help getting getting no, the set up. Now we've done it once. We're a bit more au fait with how to how to do it all. And um, yeah, yeah. Right. So in terms of the recording, what what mm -hmm. plan with that? Is that going to be? Could we make that available on the website um, or? Yes, so I think it needs to go to um, our marketing team for processing. I'll just switch the recording off now. Um.